we're so grateful for this time we're able to come together and, and worship collectively. And uh, Lord, I just pray with all of my heart that, that uh, what we do this morning will not be in vain. It will not be for ourselves. It will not be a show. It will not be a presentation. But Lord, it will just be a simple act of worship from your children to our Father. Lord, we thank you that you bless us with your spirit, that the Holy Spirit dwells in our souls and, and in our hearts, and, and Lord, that um, your presence is always with us. Lord, we, we pray now that the Holy Spirit will move in our hearts, Lord, that you will draw us closer to you, Lord, so that we, when we walk out of here, that there will be no doubt that we had a meeting and experience with you this morning. I pray we bless you this morning through all that we say and do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It's that time of year again where we promote and welcome our new first grade students into the children's ministry from the preschool department, and we present them with the Bible. It's a bittersweet moment when parents, including myself today, see their babies growing up. At this time, I would like to introduce the first grade Sunday school teachers, Miss Mary Jo Swain and Miss Joyce Rice. So if you guys will make your way, you, you ladies stand right here. Now we, I've done this for three years and we've had a lot of new members added to our congregation um, since three years ago. So a lot of you don't know this. So for those of you who do not know, these two ladies have been faithfully teaching the first grade Sunday school class here at First Baptist Church for about 35 years, consistently and consecutively. In fact, they taught me here when I was in the first grade. And this year is really special for me because now they will be the ones who will also teach my two first grade babies. Another thing I'm really excited about this year is the new study Bible that we're going to be giving the kids this year. There's a, a boy version and there's a girl version. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But um, it's not, they're not just cute on the outside. Inside contains the plan of salvation, a Bible dictionary for kids, how to have a quiet time, the family trees of David and Abraham, Bible study skills, and so, so much more. Now, let me tell you, these children are not just receiving a Bible today to take home and get dusty. Miss Mary Jo and Miss Joyce are very deliberate about teaching them how to use it, and they offer incentives to bring their Bible with them each Sunday. Those incentives are better known as, to the boys and girls, dumb, dumb suckers. In fact, I would like to tell you um, just how deliberate they are about teaching these kids. I brought Miss Joyce into my office one day, and I was showing her these new study Bibles that I wanted to start getting for the children. And when I was explaining to Miss Joyce the differences in the boy, the boy and the girl versions of the new Bible, I assured her that the actual scripture pages on the inside were the same, so that, it, so that if she needed to tell them what page to turn to, she could. Well, she quickly cut me off. She didn't even let me finish my sentence. And she said, oh, no, we don't ever tell them to turn any, to any page number. We teach them how to find the books of the Bible and how to find the scriptures. And then she took that Bible out of my hand, and she proceeded to say, you turn to the middle to find Psalms, and then you turn to the middle over here to find the New Testament. So I've gone through and whited out all the page numbers in all of the Bibles. Just kidding. So, but they, they, are, they are very consistent in teaching these children how to use these Bibles. So without further delay, I would like to call the kids to come and receive their Bible. I'm going to call you up. You're going to receive your Bible from your teacher. And then I want you to come up here on the stage and line up so everyone can see you. Okay? All right, we will start with, um, let's see, Carter Whitman Coltrane, the son of Jean and Bonnie, Bonnie Coltrane. William Walker Davis, son of Scott and Angie Davis. Emery Lynn Elkins, daughter of Mike and Virginia Elkins.
Noeli Flores, daughter of Noe and Anna Flores. Southall Hill, son of Scott and Crystal Hill. <laughs> Andy Labermeyer, son of Tommy and Whitney White. William Stark, better known as Herbie, son of Mark and Vanessa Stark. Matthew Stephen Stark, also son of Mark and Vanessa Stark. Olivia Grace Waddell, daughter of Cody and Jennifer Waddell. Samuel Harrison White, son of Craig and Sarah White. And Faith Elizabeth White, also daughter of Craig and Sarah White. Let's give these kids a round of applause. And join me in praying a prayer over them. All right, we're going to pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these precious children you have given us to raise and for the responsibility of teaching them to walk in your ways. We need your help, though. Please guide us as parents each day to not only teach them your word, but to live it out in our own lives. For we know that children learn best by example. Thank you for Miss Mary Jo and Miss Joyce who have faithfully served you and these children for so many years. I pray that these kids not only learn to look up the scriptures, but that they also comprehend what they mean and apply them to their lives, teaching their own children one day to follow you. Thank you for being our Lord and our Savior. Amen.
stand together as we sing praises to him this morning. Praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing over his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his sheep. Set me free, 
my ransom so free. The darkness is over, beholding I see a living redeemer, love healing me, forever forgiven. This love song I bring, you set me free. drop of blood that touched the ground cried Jesus saves Jesus saves a world of sin rejoiced to hear that sound Jesus saves Jesus saves I've been pardoned, full and free. Yeah. All because the blood still sees. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Even the sword that pierced his side. Cry, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. The message of his arms stretched open wide. Cry, Jesus, Jesus saves, Jesus saves.
Oh, amen. I tell you what. Why don't you just, I tell you what, folks, just if you've got a uh, bulletin or if you've got a Sunday school quarterly, just grab hold of it right now and just take it and wave it and say, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah. (laughs) Isn't that what you wanted to do anyway? You know, you're at a football game and you'll take the program and you'll wave it when they score a touchdown. You know you had that in you. Amen, amen. Thank you, ladies. Uh, While you're opening your Bibles to Genesis, the... uh, The evangelist that was with us Sunday, just uh, uh, last week actually, Sunday through Wednesday, he just spoke so highly of our church and what a blessing the church was. And one thing that he said that I think you'll find interesting was Wednesday night at the service that after after the music and the ladies' ensemble, during the song, the Holy Spirit was speaking to him and was saying, you need to now give an invitation. And he said, I didn't do it. And he said, I disobeyed the Spirit. And he said, I tell you what, the next time that happens in a service, I won't do it again. I just thought you'd find that interesting. I, I, he preached a great sermon and all, but I thought you'd be interested to know that uh, that's how moved he was by the Spirit. What a great week we had, and wonderful things uh, have, are continuing to be done as a result of the great revival that we had in this church. Please open your Bibles to Genesis 12th chapter. You've already done that, and we're continuing our series of messages, Big Events in Genesis. Now, it's a big event when the creation took place, a big event when sin came, it's a big event when the flood took place, it was a big event when uh, evolution came along and we showed where creation is true and evolution, evolution is not. But I want you to know there's another big event that took place, and 4,000 years ago, and it's called the Abrahamic Covenant. Now, on face value, it doesn't seem to have that much of an impact, but if we look closely at Scripture, we're going to find that it is still alive today, and it is having a profound impact upon the world. Before we read, let me just uh, tell you that this past week, I believe it was on uh, Thursday, the Pope, who, while he, uh, we don't, you know, totally agree on on everything theologically, he uh, is the spokesperson. He has probably the number one spokesperson when it comes to speaking on religious things. And he said this, the world is moving to World War III and that he sees it happening. Well, I'm not going to disagree with him because of all the tension that is going on right now politically, militarily, Geographically, there's tension all over the world. But most of that tension, where does it center? Well, it's right there in the Mideast. And why is there so much tension in the Mideast? Well, it's because people don't get along. Well, why don't people get along? Well, it goes back to the Abrahamic covenant. You see, God knew exactly what was going on when he made this promise to Abraham. He didn't tell Abraham 4,000 years later they're still going to be fighting over this. But he did say, I'm going to do something special through your life. Now, let's pay close attention to these verses because, you know, if you listen carefully, you're going to be amazed at what you read that's in the Word of God. Let's look and see what it has to say here in Genesis, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 4. It says, God, the Lord said to Abraham, go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Now get this. Remember this. I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you. Remember that. America, remember that. Okay? And I will curse those who treat you with contempt. But then he says, all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham did what the Lord said. Now, if you'll turn over to Genesis, the 15th chapter. Genesis, the 15th chapter, starting in verse 1. After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be great. Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Abram continued, look, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. The Lord came to him and said, 
This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look at the sky, count the stars. If you're able to count them, then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. Now get verse 6. And Abram believed the Lord and credited to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of Chaldees to give you this land to possess. What land is that? We're going to get to that later on in the message. All right, turn over to chapter 17. Chapter 17, it says here in verse 1, Abram was 99 years old. The Lord appeared to him saying, I am God Almighty. Live in my presence and be devout. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you greatly. Abram fell to the ground. God spoke with him and said, As for me, my covenant is with you. You will become the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I will make you the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. I will make nations and kings come through you. I will keep my covenant between me and you, your offspring after you throughout the generations, as an everlasting covenant. To be your God, the God of your offspring after you, and to you and your offspring after you, I will give the land where you are residing. Now get this, all the land of Canaan as an what? Eternal or everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So these are the three parts of the Abrahamic covenant that the Lord has given to Abraham. Originally, his name was Abram. Now, he has become Abraham because the full meaning of being a fruitful uh, father of many nations. When we look at this covenant, there are four things I want us to examine. The first one is this. This covenant is, number one, it's very offensive. It's a very offensive covenant because it is exclusive in nature. It's very exclusive. Who is it given to? This special blessing. Who is it given to? Well, there's an argument about that. First of all, for the Muslim, the view would be, the Muslim view would say that it was given through Ishmael to the Arabs or to the Muslim, that which we know today as the nation of Islam. Now, why do they say that? You may say, well, that's crazy. Who are they to say something like that? Oh, here is what they say. They say, Abraham is our father. And is that true? Technically, it is true. Because you see, here's what happened. Abraham and uh, Sarah got anxious about having this heir, someone through whom the blessings would come, and so they got ahead of God. Have you ever gotten ahead of God? Of course you have. They got ahead of God, and Abraham took Hagar as the maidservant, and she became pregnant, and she gave birth to Ishmael. Ishmael is now the line through which the Arabs and the Muslim have come. So when they say, Abraham is our father. They are right. And it is true, but the covenant blessing does not rest upon them. It is not their right to say that this is our land. It is not their right to say this is our covenant. The only way they can be brought into the Abrahamic covenant is for them to bow their knee and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and give their hearts to him and come to the cross like everyone else. That's the only way they can truly get in on the Abrahamic covenant. But they say Abraham is our father. But then, and so and they say, we are, you're saying we're excluded, we're not excluded. Yes, you are. The second thing would be this, the Jewish view. The Jewish view would say that the physical descendants only are privy to this blessing. Is that true? Partly true. The physical descendants of Abraham are exclusively given that blessing in part. God has said, they are my people, they are my chosen people, and I will pour my blessings upon them. And so they claim, they will say, we are the chosen people of God. Is that true? Absolutely, it is true. But it is not confined to just the physical descendants of of the Jewish line through Isaac. Okay. Now the third view and the biblical view is this, many nations... Many nations. Here's what we're saying is this. When Christ came, he became the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. In fact, he he fulfilled all the covenants in the Old Testament. He was the completion of the law. And it is through Christ 
that we as Gentiles now, we as Gentiles are made heirs. We are now grafted into the tree, into the vine. When you graft a tree, what you do is this. You take one tree and you bind it, you graft it to another one so that this one tree becomes stronger. Here's what has happened. We as Gentiles have been grafted into the vine, the Jewish vine, and therefore it is made stronger by us, as Paul said, being grafted in. Therefore, we are part of the Abrahamic blessing. Look what it says in Romans, the fourth chapter, verse 11. It says, Abraham... This is talking about Abraham. This was to make him a father of all who believe but are not circumcised. All who believe. All who confess Christ as Lord. Galatians, the third chapter, says, If you belong to Christ, now get this, you are. You're you're in on it. You're in on the blessings. Abraham's seeds. You are in on these blessings, heirs according to the promise. So this covenant blessing, comes to us. I mean, doesn't it sound great? I will multiply you. I will make you fruitful. I will make you a blessing to all the nations that we also have become part of that covenant. Is it any wonder? Now, come on, folks. Is it any wonder that our nation has been so blessed? You may say, we are, uh, what right do we have to say that we are special in the eyes of the Lord? You know, sometimes people are offended when when we say Christ is the only way to the cross, people are bothered by that. They say, you're saying Jesus is the only way. I am saying that Jesus is the only way, and there is only one chosen nation, and that is the nation of Israel. God has not changed his mind yet. This covenant is eternal forever and forever, just like salvation with you and I is eternal forever and forever. So, this uh, covenant is very offensive. It's very offensive because it is so exclusive in nature. It is, number two, it is very much misunderstood because it is perpetual in nature. I've already alluded to that. But let's just look at it again in verse, uh, in verse 7 and 8. Let's just review this perpetual thing, all right? I will keep my covenant between me and you and your offspring uh, throughout their generation. Now, notice that word underlined it, everlasting. It may say in your translation, eternal. Covenant to be your God and the God of your offspring. To your offspring, I will give the land of Canaan as an eternal possession. I mean, how, how clear is that? I mean, how powerful is that? God is saying this, Abraham, what I'm doing with you, it's, 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 it's eternal. It's forever. It's not going to be bound up and then thrown away. It is eternal. You see, in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant was fulfilled. It wasn't done, done away with. It was fulfilled. It was made stronger through the cross of Christ, through the grafting in of the Gentiles. It was not done away with, and it continues today. And a lot of people don't understand that. Those who are outside the faith, those who are not believers, those who are blinded, The God of this world has blinded their eyes. and They do not see, they choose not to see that God is at work through the nation of Israel. And they refuse to understand that this promise is eternal. Let me just give you one example of what happened this past week. In our nation today, we have become so intolerably intolerant that we just don't want to hear anything today. When I say that collectively as a nation, we just don't want to hear the truth. Uh, Senator Ted Cruz from Texas spoke, and I don't know what your political persuasions are about him, and, and I really, really, you know, it doesn't, I really, you know, he is a great Christian man, I'll tell you this. And he spoke at a, uh, I believe it was on Wednesday, he spoke at some kind of big event that was to support Christians who are being persecuted. And there were a lot of, quote, Palestinian Christians that were at this big gala event in Washington. And what happened to him was this, as he spoke, because we all know that so many Christians uh, in Iraq and the Sudan and Somalia are being persecuted and exterminated. It's just awful what is taking place. And he said, he said, we must support Israel 
Because God will bless us if we support Israel. And I'm going to tell you what happened. He was literally booed off the stage. People stood up and booed against him, called him out, and he said, I'm so sorry that you feel this way, but I want you to know that is the obligation from God Almighty that we support Israel. And to turn away from Israel is to turn away from God. And I said, God bless Ted Cruz for standing up in the midst of opposition. Because you see, there are those who would say, no, no, that, that was back then. Now is now. Folks, listen, the covenant has not, has not ceased to exist. The only way the covenant can cease to exist is like this. In the Scripture, we know that a covenant is between two people. What is it that makes a covenant binding? The two people. But when one person dies, then that covenant is no longer binding. The one example that's spoken about is marriage, a marriage covenant. When one dies, therefore the other person is not bound in marriage to them any longer. So here is the covenant. It's between God and Abraham plus what? It is between God and Abraham and his offspring. Abraham has died, but his offsprings continue. God has not died, and the offsprings continue. Therefore the covenant continues. Amen? And amen. If Israel and the Jews ever cease to exist, which will never happen, but if they were to cease to exist, then the covenant no longer would exist. It is perpetual and everlasting to everlasting. The third thing that we see about this covenant is, because, is that it is neglected because it is relational in nature. In other words, people can't comprehend those that are worldly-minded, those that have not the mind of Christ, cannot understand how that God would choose. You mean God has chosen these people? Why would God choose them? Why would God want to choose them and not us? Why would God decide that he wouldn't choose some European? I, I don't know. Why would God choose some other group, the Mongolians or some, some other group? Why? Well, the Bible tells us that God chose Abraham because of his faith and his devotion to the one true God. And he said, I'm going to make a great covenant with you and I'm going to be bound to you. And it is not based upon how good you are, it's based upon me. So what he's saying is, I'm going to love you with an everlasting love. There will never come a time when I, the Lord God, will turn my back on you. Now get this. Has there ever been a time in Scripture that you've read that the Jews have turned their back on God? Absolutely. Did God ever turn His back on them? Never. Never. He did chastise them. He did bring affliction upon them, but He never severed the relationship with them. It is relational based not upon their actions, but it is based upon the heart of God. Which, now let's fast forward to us. Our relationship as believers is not based upon our actions. It is based upon the love of God that has been shown in Christ Jesus. Through the cross, we have that everlasting covenant with God. Through the cross, we have the eternal love that is poured upon us. Through the cross, we have all the blessings that are available to us in Christ Jesus. We may turn away from Him, but He never turns away from from us. Thank the Lord because I would have lost out on my salvation more than one time. I would, if it had been based upon my good deeds and my good actions, I would have lost. But I'm so thankful that it is based upon the eternal love and security that Jesus Christ has for me. It is not based on performance, but it is based on the faithfulness. Now, do you get this? It is based on the faithfulness of God Almighty to His people. It is based on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who is always faithful to us. Now, the last thing is probably the most controversial of all things about the Abrahamic covenant. It is controversial. It is not politically correct because it is territorial in nature. Territorial in nature. And Now, this is where the tension really starts, and this is where things really get heated. And the debate really ratchets up a notch. If you'll notice in Genesis, the 15th chapter, and let's go ahead and put it on the screen. 
I want to review this verse of Scripture again. It says, he took him outside and he said, look, I'm going to give you the, look at the stars in the sky. And the Bible says that your offspring will be that numerous. Abram believed God. He credited it to him as righteousness. He said to him, I am Yahweh who brought you out of the earth of the Chaldees to give you the land to possess. Did you get that? I am giving you the Ur of the Chaldeans. Underline that. Remember that. Now, let's go over to Genesis, the 15th chapter, and let's look at verses 17, uh, 18 through 21. You'll have to uh, open your Bibles for that. We don't have it on the screen. Okay? It says, that Abraham had just offered up a sacrifice, and then it says this, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, I give you this land to your offspring from the brook of Egypt. Okay, you got that? From the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River to the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cabanites, the Termites. Oh, sorry, that's not. What's that? Hittites. Just want to make sure you're awake. Perizzites, Rephim, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and the Jebusites, and the Babdicites. No, no Babdicites there either. I'm giving you all this land. Now, as you know, and if you're familiar with history in any way, you'll notice that in, 19, uh, in 1948, the nation of Israel was founded. The UN resolution said, right here, this is what we're carving out to give and make the land of Israel. There, were no, there was no Jewish settlement there. There was only the Palestinians that were living there. And this is where the Jews, because of the great affliction they went through during World War II, they can have their own place. So, therefore, it was established and Jews from all over the world began to migrate to Israel. Now, why would you want to go to Israel? I mean, there's nothing there. It is a barren landscape, rocks and hills and nothing. There are no natural resources whatsoever there until recently. There's been a huge find of way down deep of uh, natural gas. But other than that, no natural resources. But you know what? Jews from all over the world began to migrate to Israel. Because it, like, a, uh, like, you know, the uh, illustration is that of the salmon in, the, uh, in Alaska how they will migrate back to where they were born. They'll go upriver and through all kinds of obstacles in order to get back there to, to spawn. Well, that's like the Jews. They, they had to go back to their place of origin. And for, they came from Europe. They, they came by buses and trains and airplanes. Uh, they migrated from Russia. They came from China. There were Jews in the Mongolian area of China. I'm telling you, over the next 10 to 20 years, there was, there was this incredible migration of Jews to Israel because they had to go back to the land of Abraham, the place that was their calling. And you know that that has caused, since then, that's caused all kinds of chaos because the, uh, the Arabs... The Palestinians have fought with them ever since. And it has been amazing how that God's hand has always been with Israel and brought protection to them, despite the best efforts of all those that have opposed them. Now, here's what I want you to see again. You've got to read it one more time. Verse 8 in chapter 17. To you and your offspring after you, I will give the land where you are residing, all the land of Canaan. Remember that all the land of Canaan, as an eternal possession, I will be their God. Ezekiel 11 verse 17 says that there will be this great migration of Jews, the Hebrew people, back to Israel because by Ezekiel's day, they have been scattered through the, uh, through the attacks and Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon coming and uh, destroying Jerusalem and taking uh, Israel captive. Here is what Ezekiel says to them 
while they are in captivity. This is what the Lord God says. I will gather you from the people and assemble you from the countries. Did you get that? I will assemble you from the countries where you have been scattered. And I will give you the land of Israel. Now, folks, I want to show you the land, not that we're talking about. I want to show you the land that God is talking about. This is the land that God is talking about. Uh, Iraq, half of Iraq, one quarter of Egypt, almost all of Syria, down into Saudi Arabia. This is the land that God gave to Israel. Now, where is Israel? If you look over in the uh, top left part and you see the, the gray part and that sliver That's about the size of Rhode Island, and that's where Israel is now. To which it begs the question, why are those that are fighting with Israel, why are they not satisfied with what uh, what Israel has said, we'll settle for this? You see, if it was really true where they could take everything that belongs, there would be the riches of the oil fields of Saudi Arabia, that northern part of Saudi Arabia. Exxon really loves it, is what I'm going to tell you. (laughs) Iraq, why did we fight in Iraq? Well, it wasn't because we loved Iraq so much. Because we all know that oil is the the, uh, economic blood that flows through the veins of the economy in America. Why is all of this going on? And so we see here that this is what God was talking about when he talked about the land of Canaan. You notice the part about Egypt, all the way up to the river Euphrates and and, and across. So what we have today is this great war that still really is going on with Israel. Hamas is bombing Israel and saying, we want the land back. The Palestinians are fighting for all of this. And I would say to them, Don't you know you're not fighting against Israel? You are fighting against God Almighty. How dare you think that you can lift your hand against the people of God? How dare you think? How foolish are you? Why You don't know how good you've got it. Uh, The Palestinians are saying, we want the Golan Heights. And you know, our government, depending upon who's in power has pressured Israel to give the Golan Heights. This government today is pressuring Israel about giving the Golan Heights. And let me tell you what it would be like for Israel to give up the Golan Heights. To give up the Golan Heights, which is a mountain range that semi-circles around Israel, is equivalent to the United States taking the port of New Orleans. If you've been to New Orleans, you've seen how incredibly important the port of New Orleans where all the barges and ships come through, it would be the equivalent of us saying we're going to give to ISIS, you know, you're familiar now with that, we're going to give to ISIS the port of New Orleans so that they can have, uh, we know that they have said they won't bother us. That, that's what it is equivalent. If we were, that would be what it would be like for Israel to give up the Golan Heights. Anybody knows in warfare, what do you want? You want the high places so that you can protect the nation that is below. I'm telling you, the Bible says this, I will bless those who bless you. And I will bring curses upon those who curse you. I'm not saying our nation is cursing Israel, but I'm saying the leadership in the White House and the leadership in the government is incredibly cool towards Israel. I don't see any blessings coming out of our nation's capital. I hear and see a grudging okay. And I'm telling you, if you turn away from Israel, you turn away from God. There are two people you cannot turn away from and expect God to bless. Number one, you cannot turn away from the unborn. You turn away from the unborn, God said, He said, you spill the blood of the innocent, I'll spill your blood. We got a lot of blood in the streets in America today, don't we? He said, you spill the blood of the innocent, I'll spill your blood. The second thing is this, you cannot turn away from, the other person would be the people of Israel. 
and expect the blessings of God. It's just as plain and simple as that. So in conclusion, let's, let's just think and pray about a couple of things, all right? First of all, God will keep his promise regardless of any foreign or domestic agenda. It doesn't matter what comes out militarily or governmentally, God is going to keep his promise. He will, I think that what will happen is he will allow Israel to suffer and to hurt, but he will never allow Israel to be defeated. God is going to protect and take care of Israel Second thing is this, our perspective is to be from the Word of God, not from the media. If I watch CNN much longer, I'm going to lose a television because it'll have a hole in it. (laughs) I'm telling you. (laughs) Thankfully, I'm too cheap to do anything irrational like that, but I have threatened. Because of the bias that has been shown towards Hamas and the Palestinians and and not uh, for Israel. I'm like, what What are you doing? The third thing would be this, MSNBC, NBC, I'm going to throw those in the same pot as well. Just ungodly, uncaring about what the Bible has to say. The third thing would be this, those who believe in Christ also inherit this promise. Folks, you don't have to look at, if you're a Christian, you do not have to look at the Jews and be jealous. You're in on it too. You and I are in on it too because of what? Christ. Aren't you glad? At the cross, Christ brought us into the blessings, the covenant blessings as well. Let's give thanks to God for that, all right? Now, if you, have you made a covenant with the Lord by salvation? Christ made a covenant with us when he died on the cross. He said, if you'll receive me, I'll receive you. So today's the day for you to call upon him as Savior and Lord. We're not talking about a ritual. You may have joined the church. You know, Baptists, we have our rituals if you'll join the church. People think that gets them saved. No. If you join the Lions Club, it doesn't make you a lion. (laughs) If you join the church, it doesn't make you a Christian. What you have to join in with Jesus. You have to, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You've got to be a sinner that realizes you need a Savior. Now, maybe you did it when you were eight. Maybe you did it when you were 18. Or maybe when you were 48. But if there's never been a time, today's the day for you to give your heart to Christ. Like our evangelist said, he said, I've stopped listening for the shout. And I've started listening for the trumpet because it seems like it could happen any day that the Lord would return. Rabbi Greg said this. He said, Jews from all over the world have come back to Israel, except one group. There's only one group that hasn't. Want to know where they live? Where do they live? Right here. Right here in America. He said, they don't want to leave. They've got a comfortable, and him being Jewish, he was very, very rich. He gave it all away when he became a Christian. But he said, we, he said they don't want to leave the comfort and the lifestyle that they have, so they're not going to leave America. There's only one thing that will cause them to leave America and come to Israel. What do you want to guess? Financial loss. That's the only thing that will get their attention. And if the Jews suffer financial loss, guess what's going to happen to you and you and me? (laughs) We're going to be in the same boat too. So it is his belief that America will suffer a great financial loss that will bring an awakening in the last days. I don't know what it will look like. All I know is the Lord says he's returning. Let's be ready. Let's, Let's bow in prayer. If you've never given your heart to Christ, please do so. Please do so. Maybe you uh, made a decision during the revival service and you need to follow through with that. Now's the time to do that. Follow through in giving your heart to the Lord and trusting Him. Follow through with a commitment about baptism 
of becoming a part of the church. We're going to pray, begin our time of invitation. Lord, thank you for the great blessings. I'm amazed, in spite of our stubborn sinfulness, that you want to bless us. And you never pull back even when we do. Oh, Lord, forgive us as believers in Christ for doing that. How I pray that our church and our people here, we would recommit ourselves more than ever before to you. Now during this time, Lord, the souls that are being stirred and brought to you, would, would, would we see fruit from that for us? In your name we pray. Amen.